never changing world, but always changing lives. Presents a voice of truth and inspiration. This is Life Changes with Filippo, with unforgettable, ever insightful conversations that captivate our fascination and insatiability for inspiring moments of real life journeys. As we, as one, strive for higher planes of existence and a better understanding of our true selves, the I am, and the world in which we live. Always remembering that life changes. This is radio like you've never felt before. This is Life Changes with Filippo with tonight's guest, author, and investigative journalist, Philip Coppins. And now, your host, Filippo Voltaggio. Ciao, everyone. I'm excited about this show. You know, we've been doing the show for uh, almost three years, is it? Uh, I think going on three years. And it, it seems like every show, there's something new, something exciting. And you, you would think that we have covered so much material and we have tried so many new things. But no, yet another first. Our guest tonight, as Mark said, Philip Coppins, is uh, on because he's the editor of Odyssey of the Gods, Eric Von Donneken's uh, new book, The History of Extraterrestrial Contact in Ancient Greece. So he's going to be talking for Eric Von Donneken, since Eric uh, does not do interviews in America. However, he's also the author of his own book, The Ancient Alien Question, A New Inquiry into the Existence, Evidence, and Influence of Ancient Visitors. And so we'll be talking to Philip about his book as well. So we get two for one today, and and that's exciting and new for us. So actually, as I was thinking about today's show and what we're going to be talking about, uh, uh, Odyssey of the Gods and Ancient Aliens and Greece and Greek mythology and UFOs and aliens and all that good stuff, I was getting, can I say angry, I, I, frustrated, uh, perturbed. It, it, it's as if I almost feel like, why are we having this conversation? I, I almost feel like we should have, I, I should have been, I should have grown up knowing all of this stuff instead of thinking all of this stuff was mythology, assuming it's true. And even assuming it's not true, then at the very least, I should have grown up um, having a doubt or having a, a doubt placed in my mind or having a, the thought placed in my mind from teachers or, or uh, from films or, or, or news or, or whatever, that there is a possibility that we don't know what the heck we're talking about, the teachers could have said, but we we think this is what it is instead i was taught that uh you know the 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 pyramids were built by all these little slaves um which partly might be true but when you start to look at some of the things in these books and many other books that are starting to come out now, with people starting to say, uh, say that there were giants on the planet at one time, they could have built the pyramids a lot easier than a lot of little slaves, um, that there were... Uh, uh, that, that stones were somehow magnetized or, or uh, uh, somehow gravity was, was changed or, or something where the stones were lifted, uh, that, that spaceships might have had pulleys where they pulled them and, and it, the, the, the stones weren't heavy for them. You know, there are so many other explanations that were never explained to us. And as children growing up, as a matter of fact, we watched movies like Jason and the, and the Argonauts or read books like Jason and the Golden Fleece. And, 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 you know, even Disney has Hercules. And of course, we had seen Hercules movies growing up and all that stuff. But these were all presented as, as if, these people that we were talking about were 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 mythological characters were were gods uh that that didn't exist but but you know what a fun story uh just what an imagination well it could be a fun story and it, and it could be all imagined but it could be all true or at least there may be some truth in here and it and it perturbed me that now we're having a conversation to try and figure out, you know, we have to change the way we think. Um, and, and it's like, okay, I'll do that. 
but it just seems like have we been has this stuff been hidden from us or or have people been that ignorant or or do people really talk like they know but they don't know shit I, you know and that's that's where the the perturbation came from if that's a word and it reminded me of being in college at UC San Diego University of California San Diego I was I think at the time uh a junior um I was young and and by young I mean uh I was young to the world I I was raised under a rock in a small town by very religious and conservative parents who were afraid of the world for their own reasons because they were immigrants and they had lived through a, a war and that kind of thing. So I'm not here to blame them. I'm just saying that I kind of was raised in a way that even my thoughts that were outside of what the family believed, my parents were were afraid to let me think those thoughts. So so I grew up with with kind of a a closed mind about a lot of things and Going to UC San Diego, where at the time the art um, was, uh, the artists that were going there were, were creating art that was so new to the world and so different than anything the world had seen. The music that was being created at the time was so different. And still, what I heard back then is still not out there today. It was just that new and that different. And and so the same with a lot of the philosophies and, and the sciences. I would get it, go into my physics class and the professor would walk in and say, I discovered this today and tomorrow you'll read in the journals that blah, 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 blah. These were people that were very on the forefront of things. And there was a particular sculpture I saw one day on campus that was exhibited that really shocked me out, out of my core. And it was kind of like a Greek sculpture, it, 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 but it was just a torso. No, no arms, no neck, and no legs. But I remember it having, um, it, was, it was contorted, it was, it was bizarre, all of it was bizarre to me. And then it had this enormous, bizarre-looking penis and it was very accentuated, and I was appalled, never having been exposed to a lot of things, including penises, <laughs> you know, in a way, uh, uh, that it, I, I just thought, wow, what an appalling thing to have on the campus of a, of a university with a bunch of young boys and girls running around here. And, and that's how sheltered I was. And, and I, if I looked back, it might not have been such a bad thing. Thing. It might actually have been interesting or thought-provoking, whatever. But where I'm getting at with this story was that I went home to my apartment where I lived with my brother um, uh, off campus, and he had a friend visiting who also went to UC San Diego. And that night, I had made dinner for the three of us to eat, and we were sitting down eating, and I shared with the two of them that I had seen this sculpture. I I was so repressed um, and so shy about saying the thing about the penis that I never mentioned the penis. So I just mentioned that there was this grotesque, were probably my words, my word at the time, uh, sculpture in the plaza of the campus. And my brother's friend said, it wasn't that grotesque. And I said, well, I, I mean, and I started to to defend where I was coming from, never mentioning the body part. And this friend started to defend, uh, defend his view on how I, 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 I looked at it wrong and, and how he's right and how art is supposed to be and blah, 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 and how I shouldn't think this way or that way. And so I said, well, what did you think about that particular part, you know? And he avoided the answer. And then I asked him again specifically, and he ev evaded the question. Um, and then I realized that he had never seen the sculpture. Because I said there is a particular part that is large and obvious. I want you to tell me what that is before we continue the conversation. And he turned red, 
and embarrassed and couldn't answer the question. And I said, I cannot believe that we are having a conversation about a particular piece of art that you have never seen. And I got up and left the table, and I was frustrated and perturbed at the time as well. But the point is, is that if he had said, tell me about the sculpture, or tell me what repulsed you about it, or do you know that art is supposed to do this, and though I have not seen the sculpture, it's supposed to probably evoke a certain feeling inside of you. Then we can talk about art and about what it it does philosophically. But instead, he was trying to convince me that he knew something about something he knew nothing about. And as I look through these books, The Ancient Alien Question and Odyssey of the Gods, I think of all the teachers, professors, and adults, and priests, and all these people that have talked to me about these things over the years, knew absolutely nothing about them, had never been there, had never really studied them. And, and these people don't know if there were ancient aliens or if the gods were really existed or if they were really aliens or if there are UFOs or not UFOs. But all my life, I have been made to believe like this stuff is crazy. And now there are people coming along saying, hey, not so fast. And I'm grateful to Eric Von Doniken and Philip Coppens. Whether any of this is true or not, I believe there's, there's truth in here, but I do know that we are opening a closed mind that has been closed for way too long. And I am looking forward to opening up that mind more today with our guest, Philip Coppens, right after this. Clean water is not enough. Reverse osmosis, distilled water, and most bottled waters are devoid of naturally occurring minerals. They are acidic, unstructured, and hard to absorb and rob minerals from the body. Ionways ionizers produce a super abundant supply of powerful antioxidants in each glass. Ionized water has a reduced molecular cluster size and a negative charge, hydrating you up to six times better. Water from an Ionways ionizer will help you restore your body to its natural pH balance, boosting your vitality. An ionized water more effectively flushes acidic toxins from within your body. Drink the healthiest water available today. Ionways Water Systems, their water changes everything. To learn more about Ionways Water Systems and how you can own one today, visit our website at lifechangeswithfilippo.com and click on our sponsor page. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with your host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can visit us online via Twitter and Facebook and at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. Well, we're back. I am Filippo Voltaggio, and like uh, about a year ago when we had George Sukalos on our show, when he was talking about Eric Von Doniken's book, uh, Twilight of the Gods. We have Philip Copens on the show today talking uh, about Eric Von Donegan's new book, Odyssey of the Gods, The History of Extraterrestrial Contact in Ancient Greece, because uh, Philip uh, was the editor on the book and because Eric does not do interviews in the United States. Um, a little bit about Eric, uh, his lifelong fascination with extraterrestrial visitors first found its expression in 1968 with the international bestseller Chariots of the Gods. His books have been since then translated into 28 different languages and have sold more than 63 million copies. His latest books are the bestsellers Twilight of the Gods and History is Wrong. In addition to his writing, he is an ever-present figure on the international lecture circuit and is regularly featured in documentaries and on TV. As a matter of fact, on um, uh, Philip's and uh, Giorgio's uh, show, Ancient Aliens. And Philip, again, not only is the editor of that book, but he's also an author himself. Uh, the book that he has just authored is The Ancient Alien Question. He's also an investigative journalist, ranging from the world of politics to ancient history and mystery. He co-hosts the Spirit Revolution radio show with his partner Kathleen McGowan, 
and is a frequent contributor to the Nexus Magazine and Atlantis Rising Magazine. Since 1995, he has lectured extensively and has appeared in a number of television and DVD documentaries, including Ancient Aliens, the series in the, on the History Channel. He is the author of The Stone Puzzle of Rosalind Chapel and many other books. Uh, we welcome to the show Philip Coppins. Thank you for having me, Filippo. Uh, thank you. Uh, how did you like my rant at the beginning of the show, Philip? It's um, it's an interesting overview to to see how you um, pulled in the story. But yes, definitely, you know, we we have eyes to see, but sometimes we are blind, and sometimes we like to comment on things whereby we really just want to. Uh, it's it's not your rant, but it's it's the rant of of your brother of of basically making sure that. Um, you know, his paradigm doesn't get upset. Mm-hmm. You know, and actually, we, we're, I, I, we just might upset some paradigms today. And let's start with um, Eric Von Donneken's book, Odyssey of the Gods. I, I mean, in it, he talks about Jason and the Argonauts, which we saw as kids on TV and read in, in books, as if it really happened. Could you tell us about that? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things about Greece, ancient Greece, is that we think we are so familiar with it. We grow up with it. We read their mythology. We think the ancient Greeks are like us. And this is something which has been bred to us. We see them as a cradle of civilization. We see them as the beginning of democracy. We see them as the inventors of this and the discoverers of death. And really, um, what Eric is doing with Odyssey of the Gods is to show that the ancient Greeks could just as well have come from a not not literally speaking but definitely symbolically speaking a different planet and the reason why he goes into this is because our view of what ancient greece really is has been reworked in the last two centuries and so when you read today's stories of jason and the argonauts you really have what seems to be a group of guys who get together, decide to go on a ship to a foreign country and go in search of this thing called the Golden Fleece. And so the question then is, what is this Golden Fleece? And as as Eric puts it, oh, it's a piece of fur. And straight away you would think like, "Mm, either they were extremely drunk or something else is going on here. And in essence, what Eric does is he strips away what people quite often think is translations. You know, when you buy these books today, you will see it says translated by. But it really should say edited and rewritten by whoever. (laughs) Because because what has happened over the last, specifically again, two centuries, is that people have um, gone out and said, well, we don't understand this passage. And if we don't understand it, because gosh, we're academics, uh, definitely none of our readers will understand this. So we think... um, you know, the people who wrote Jason and the Argonauts, um, probably meant to say this. And so rather than highlight this, they, they just re-edit it. And what you have today is a story which is retold and retold and reworked and reworked. So what Eric tries to do is go as close to the source, source sorry, as can possibly be. And what he finds is a far different story. First of all, you have Jason, who goes to this foreign land, because what he hopes to find there is a piece of machinery. And the reason why it's a piece of machinery is because um, the Golden Fleece is said to be able to fly or potentially fly. Mm. And people in his entourage say, hey, we think we can pilot this. We think we can navigate this for you. So this is why he takes them along. And part of his group is also people who are aware of the fact that the object which they're going to go in search of is actually protected by a defense system. Now, again, they have made this into dragons and other other otherworldly creatures who somehow do these weird things like breed fire. But when you go into the detail of it, you are coming up with a frequency, a regularity, um, if not an on and off switch, of a defense system which is clearly um, protecting the Golden Fleece, which is, once again, an object which, um, you know, is is potentially able to fly. Mm. And so what you have here is something completely different than what we are led to believe. And in short, this ex- this example, but several other examples, really shows a different aspect to the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks, when all their myths, they're not leaving us ancient science fiction, but what they're leaving us is really stories. And stories of saying, hey, our world is crazy, our world is bizarre. 
are. Um, and we are making a record of this because we want our descendants to actually know what once was happening here on ancient Greek soul, soil rather, and um, w- with the stories we grew up with. And so it's a completely different perspective on ancient Greece um, than I think which we have been led to and force-fed in school and culturally. So in essence, uh, for example, there could have been dragons on the earth, or if these were extraterrestrials, then there could have been some sort of machinery that like maybe spit out uh, a, a bolt of, of electricity or something to anybody who, who got close. And so like when we see things for the first time that we've never seen before, we, we try and describe it with things that we've already seen the or thing, something like that, right, Philip? Absolutely. I mean, you know, let's go back to the, atom, the atomic bomb explosion. What you see is a giant mushroom cloud. Right. Now, go forward 500 years from now, and somebody gets confronted with this imagery whereby we're describing and saying something happened, something exploded, um, and it looked like a giant mushroom. Well, what we are doing today is we're forgetting the word like. And if our descendants 500 years from now are going to treat us in the same way we are treating our ancestors, they're going to ridicule us and say, giant mushrooms exploding? What were, <laughs> you know, what were they on in the 20th century? But what we're doing is we are making use of symbolism. We're describing something which we're seeing. And everybody, when I said giant mushroom, everybody will get, oh, yeah, that's that image. Our thoughts might even go back to black and white because obviously that was what was happening in, uh, in 1945. And really, the same thing is happening with the Greeks. They are using things like when Zeus is saying thunder and lightning, um, you know, were his weapons. Um, we are thinking, oh, oh, these poor Greeks, they were so stupid. Um, they didn't understand that thunder and lightning were natural phenomena. And so they thought that there was somehow a guy in charge of them. And, um, you know, they thought that this creature was Zeus. No, what you're saying is Zeus is a a deity and we saw certain things happening in the sky and the things we saw happening in the sky uh, emanating from the weaponry which was at this creature's disposal look like thunder and lightning. Again, the word like gets dropped so often. Mm. Um, and, And that is really it. You know, we're using descriptive language to convey imagery to people who had not witnessed this. Uh, Philip, okay, so so what's the big deal here? If if uh, what Eric is saying in the book here is is true, and if the gods are were real, and if they were extraterrestrial beings, then what does that mean for us here, little mankind, after all these centuries? And what does it mean for our modern civilization? It means a lot. Um, first of all, it will radically redefine us as a species. Um, in, in my own book, I, I go into this more than Eric because Eric's book is specifically about the ancient Greeks. Um, my book is, is more general as to what is you know, the ancient alien question to us today. And the very first chapter is one small step for man, uh, one giant leap for, for mankind because it really touches upon this thing. We are a species who partly lives with amnesia, but also a species who doesn't respect where we come from. We have completely turned around some of the beliefs of our ancestors. Most cultures always believed and primitive, what we call primitive societies, you know, native traditions which are still um, in existence in, in places like the Amazon and various other places. We have always said that these um, you know, civilizations, it, that we are doing this alone, that we were never helped, and that is not true. The ancient Egyptians were very clear that the gods at one point lived amongst them. The Hopi Indians from Arizona say the same thing. Incas from Peru, the same thing. Most of these ancient civilizations will tell you that the path of civilization was not walked by them themselves, but that they were helped either by physical non-human creatures or what I would describe as metaphysical contact with non-human creatures. Now, that is something extraordinarily powerful because it means that we have had this bond with non-human intelligences. Right now, we are living in a society who is absolutely denying 
any such thing as potentially happening. And there are several impacts on, on, on our current existence. One of them is um, that we seem to think that somehow, you know, we, we no longer have big dreams. When you look at the 1950s, when you look at the 1960s, we wanted to survive the Cold War. We wanted to go to the moon. We had these big ambitions. Um, right now, there is no such thing. Yet there is a hunger for mankind to have a larger vision. And right now, nothing is feeding that larger vision. And sometimes this takes the form of screaming at our politicians. Um, you know, it happened in, in recent times. People want to have answers as to what is there about the UFO um, phenomenon. Are we, alone in, are we alone in the universe? Is there more to life than, than just, you know, this passage of time between birth and death? Is there something called the afterlife? And none of these things are currently addressed in our society. And the possibility um, that we are not alone and the possibility that we were not alone in the past is really going to change um, society. Not in the sense that all of a sudden everything is going to become rosy colored, but it is going to change so much from the paradigm in which we live in um, that it really will have a extraordinary effect and it'll give us a redefinition as to where we stand. We think we are at the pinnacle of everything. You know, like evolution, uh, the way science has taught it, is like a straight way to us. Um, the the aspects of, like, technology, we think we are the first people to have ever done anything whatsoever with technology. Um, we think that we have contact with uh, ET or non-human intelligence is still in the future. Um, all of these things will be completely redefined. We will get as a species, which is actually quite arrogant, um, a completely different um, definition as to who we are. Yeah, I, 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 arrogant is a, is a good word. Uh, unfortunately, stupidity comes to mind. But um, I, I, I honestly, this this all does uh, frustrate me, and it's hard to know. The truth, because there there are people out there that 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 think they're aliens themselves and are trying to tell people I'm an alien, and and then you look at them and you say, well, you know, th this is a weird thing coming from from you, but they might be right. Then there are people that say that they're not aliens, but there are aliens amongst us, and then there are the people that that say that the aliens have been working with the governments, etc. And yet, in this day and age, like you mentioned, at a time when uh, there is so much frustration in in the world and and in what people are calling the ninety nine percent one can say, okay, the gods have been working if the gods have been here uh, they 've been working with that one percent. What does that mean to everybody else well i don 't believe that you know like i mean f first of all, there have always been stupid people, and there are stupid people today, so people who claim that they are an alien. Um, you know, it's it's quite easy to demonstrate whether or not they would be, um, and a DNA test is, is is the most logical and, and simple um, solution to this problem. There are people who believe that they're probably related to Obama, um, you know, and, and and Putin. If you're going to look in Russia, or that they claim that they're long lost descendants of 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 the Russian Tsar. There are so many outlandish theories out there that really none of them are you know have any bearing on on the, on the real debate. Um, the real debate is about the fact that for millennia, people who were at the forefront of technology and at the forefront of civilization have always said that they did not do certain things alone, that they were helped by the gods. And it's not so much that it's a sense of, of, of 1%. I think um, what, what we're seeing is that there is this... Um, I would say exchange whereby the gods or other intelligences give certain things to certain people and then it's up to those people to actually bring it to the other people in this world. And a very recent 
recent example, um, which I think has an awful lot of bearing on the ancient problems, um, is the fact that a guy like Terence McKenna accesses this other dimension, uh, is told by a non-human intelligence that time is not a byproduct of gravity and our standard laws of physics, but that time is actually something which is real and has a mathematical sequence all to its own. And Terence McKenna was given this sequence and basically told, here it is, it's a fractal wave, now you go and figure it out, and if you figure it out, um, you will find that there is a reason why certain things called novelty, i.e. new things, happen in certain times more often than um, at other times. And he basically is, is given that, and Terence could have sat on this uh, and never published this, and the world would not have, never have been the wiser that he was given this, because he realized that he wasn't really that clever when it came to mathematics. He basically published his... Um, equation and led it to others to find out whether they could ever do anything with that. Now, Terence was a guy very much from the 20th century. He was able to access this uh, other dimension, but he wasn't really trained into doing so. What you have in, in the ancient past is is really people whose mission it was to be go-betweens between this reality and the reality of the gods, the non-human intelligences. And so what you have is, is a design... This, sorry, is a discipline of people who were absolutely trained in making this contact, establishing this contact, and downloading information and applying that information to the greater good um, of mankind and or certain projects. Um, and, and this is something which you see um, happening throughout pretty much the entire world. And it's once again saying that you know, this path of civilization wasn't worked um, just by by mankind itself. It was something which was common to all our ancestors. And to a large extent, it was for the benefit and the, the glorification um, of, of, of everybody in that civilization. It is pretty much just us who has once again, you know, got this this quite insular view. When we look at, at the way we look at history, we see Hitler, we see Confucius, we see Jesus, we see this, we see that. Um, well, guess what? In their times, all of these people were surrounded by people. They were movements. Um, you know, we all know about the Karl Rose, we all know about the Dick Cheney's, about the Donald Rumsfeld's, the Condoleezza Rice's, who uh, were hanging around George Bush. The same thing happened with these people in the past. Um, and the more time passes on, um, you know, the more the Rice's and the Rumsfeld's will be forgotten and George W. Bush Jr. will be the only one who we are going to remember. Um, though in the case of Dick Cheney, probably will always remember him. But... Um, you know, it, it's it's once again our view towards the the past that we think this is was just um, a few individuals who were doing certain things. Building the Great Pyramid was a mass movement. It was something which had the support and the input from uh, pretty much a majority of, of ancient Egypt because it could never have been done without an entire society saying, yep, we can take these people off the fields uh, and the rest of the world will still be fed um, and we will be able to do this because that and this will happen. It was an extraordinary amount of project management um, which was coordinated across um, ancient Egypt for this to happen. And the reason why it was meant to happen was because it was deemed to be so important um, as a society that there were members, selected officials from that society who were going to make contact with the divine on a regular basis, if not a regulated basis. Hmm. Well, I have a feeling that we as society have something very important to build and it's going to take as many of us as possible and and uh, that can be just as important as the Great Pyramid or maybe even more for our civilization at the moment. But let's uh, talk about that when we come back and see how that applies to the ancient alien question um, and uh, therefore your book, Philip. Um, if you want to know more about what we're talking about and, of course, about our authors, Eric Von Donegan and Philip Copens, you can always go to lifechangeswithfilippo.com or lifechangesnetwork.com. Or you can go to a Warwick Associates.net. That's W A R W I C K Associates.net. And you can find both the books there. We'll be right back with Philip Copens right after this. Mm -hmm. 
There are self-help seminars costing thousands of dollars guaranteeing miraculous transformations. There are compelling speakers and life-changing weekend experiences where you can walk on fire. They all deliver revelations that guarantee you'll come back for the more expensive revelations filled with even greater wonder next month on Fiji. We get addicted to positive, heartfelt, expensive theater. What we really need is a jumpstart, an awakening. Someone who can give us a reminder that everything we need lies within. Through inspiration and practical knowledge, Dorothy Donahue helps people get grounded and motivated, inspired and energized. It's not just words and affirmations and the power of intention. It's a mindset brought about by a tangible, transcendental experience, an audiovisual, physical, spiritual experience that helps us realize we transform ourselves. We get tools to become the conscious co-creators of lives of unlimited potential. Find out more. Go to DorothyDonahue.com. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with our host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can hear tonight's show and all our past shows, which include luminaries such as David Wilcock, Mariel Hemingway, Giorgio Sukalos, Marcy Shymoff, and Shadow Stevens on our archive page at our website at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O dot com. Remember, you can also connect with us via Twitter and Facebook and now in our own community at lifechangesnetwork.com where real people come together to share real life in real time. That's lifechangesnetwork.com. And we're back. I am Filippo, and we've been talking with uh, Philip Coppens about the book Odyssey of the Gods, Eric von Donneken's book, and his very own book, The Ancient Alien Question. And before we took a break, I mentioned, Philip, that uh, I felt that our civilization at the moment had something very important to build that was uh, perhaps just as important, if not more important, than the Great Pyramids uh, in order for us to survive. And, and I think that ties into what you're saying in the, in the book, The Ancient Alien Question, because somehow it all ties into the 2012 phenomenon. How can you bring that all together for us? Well, the, the 2012 phenomenon is obviously interesting, and there are so many um, aspects to this. I was actually asked uh, almost a year and a half ago now to actually write a short ebook called 2012 Science or Fiction to really help the vast majority of people out there into kind of defining what 2012 was all about. And while so doing, um, you know, I, I looked into some of the details, and, and really the, the only thing which we know for sure about the 2012 phenomenon is that there is an inscription in Tortuguero, which is uh, in, in Central America. And on that inscription, it basically says that on, the, on 2012, uh, December 21st, what is expected is the return of the nine gods. Now, some skeptics will tell you that uh, some of these words are missing, but there is an extraordinary amount of anthropological evidence that says that every 400 years um, in sub-cycles, really, um, of, of the, the 2012 phenomenon. Basically, the long count calendar uh, started on August 12, 1312 uh, BC, and every 400 years afterwards, uh, there were um, back to ending ceremonies. And each time, the nine deities were set to return as well and end the cycle. And then together with the leaders of mankind, specifically, of course, in this case, the, the Mayan elders, um, what was decided was the fate of the next um, time period, uh, whether that was 400 years or whether that was 5,000 years. And when you start looking into specifically the works of Frank Walters to do with the Hopi, you're becoming a very interesting um, approach towards this entire Mayan mythology. And in there, what they're basically doing is relating uh, accounts as to how this age specifically had to do with the development of spirituality, whereas before it was more um, to do with um, evolution of, on a kind of physical level. And so the last 5,000 years, when you look at that 3,100 BC framework, you really see that civilization um, is something which we have walked 
um, as a species altogether. And the end conclusion is that we are a, almost a year away from, from uh, December 21st, 2012, and we have a global village. We really have become one global civilization, for better or for worse. And what is specifically of interest is that it is said that it was an, on this August date, um in 3,112 BC, that the gods convened at Teotihuacan, which is just outside of Mexico City, and decreed the fate um, of this world. And so once again, you have this mythology, which always keeps coming back to the fact, the simple fact that all of our ancestors always believed that this path of civilization, uh, the path which mankind has set itself upon uh, for a period of time, but specifically in the last 5,000 years, is something which we never did alone, that we did this in coots uh, with non-human intelligences. And this is also something which I think is bringing it up to, to 2012. We have become a global uh, village now, and when you look at the situation we are in today, when you look at the Occupy movements in America, the crisis of the euro um, in uh, Europe, um, various other challenges in the world, um, you know, Japan this year was dealt a extraordinary blow with the earthquakes and realization that they really should look the way they are using um, some of their needs for um, economic power. Um, all of these things really are questions which are being posed um, by certain things um, you know, out there, um, whether it is nature, whether it is coincidence, or whether it, there is some kind of, you know, plan or whether it is just um, mankind doing these things to themselves. But by coincidence or by sheer planning from a more uh, global side of things, because remember, the time wave which was given by Terence says that certain things do happen at certain moments in time. And so um, really we are once again being asked as a species where we are going to go. And I don't think it's a coincidence that all of these things are rising to the forefront, specifically in 2012, at a moment in time when, for the very first time, we really have become a global village. At no other moment in time have we ever been this closely connected through means of, of Internet and various other technologies um, than ever before in the last 5,000 years, if not longer. You know, Philip, when you're talking about uh, this, th this in the way you're doing, and 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 I'm thinking about the movies that I saw as a child, and I don't remember if it was Jason and the Argonauts or, or or which one it was, but at one point you had the gods lounging around, and they were parting the the clouds or something, looking down on their people and saying, "Oh, we really should help him do this," or or somebody should whisper in his ear about this, and and. So I have that image, and at the same time, I have the image of of me as a child with a um, with a, a terrarium, you know, uh, uh, with little ants, and me deciding the fate of these little ants. And and in the analogy, we are the little ants, um, and and the the god decides whether he's going to shake up the terrarium or or just is tired of it and throw it out and. It all seems so make believe, and and yet it all could be true. Um, it just puts me in a weird state, thinking. So I'm this little ant, and if the guy who owns this terrarium feels like throwing it away, what could I do? Well, I, I think this is you know not something which is typical of of whether or not uh, God exists or whether gods exist or um, whatever. I think it is something to do with. Um, human life as a whole. So I think this question is larger than just that. But I, I mean, when it when it applies to specifically the ancient alien debate, uh, I think there's an awful lot of people out there who are trying to say that it's you know, like you know, the aliens were bad. Sitchin was was probably the, the the best example of this. There's an awful lot of conspiracy theories out there about how. Um, you know, there are Illuminati and all of these things. But when you really start looking at the evidence, when you start looking at what our ancestors were saying, um, you come away with two things. Yes, the gods were sometimes irate, um, and specifically when mankind began to meddle into their affairs. Um, it is almost as if, you know, you and uh, your family has a, a family squad, and your neighbor, who really has no business in getting himself in there, um, starts 
deciding that he will become a partner into this debate. Uh, at that moment in time, specifically in Greek mythology, uh, you're beginning to see that the gods can become quite irate. Uh, but other than that, at all moments in times, you really see that this... Um, presence of non-human intelligences into our society is very much a benevolent one. It's very much like, okay, we are here. If you want us, you can contact us. If you don't want us, okay, that's fine with us as well. And that I think is very much similar to, to the situation where we're in today. Um, it's, it's actually typical of a story which was in the Lament, uh, which was a, a text which was written at the end of the ancient Egyptian um, empire. And it's a lament in the sense that the ancient Egyptians are saying that there will come a time that the only thing they will see in Egypt, that the descendants will see in Egypt, um, are ruins and mummies. And they will not realize that the gods were once present there and walked amongst them. Uh, and I always think it's very funny because that's precisely the way we are looking towards ancient Egypt right now. Mm. Uh, anything we're looking about is you know, archaeology and mummies and ruins. Um, and, and nobody even touches this idea that the ancient Egyptians actually had wisdom traditions and had initiatory schools. Um, and there is, is so much there um, whereby the gods kind of go, okay, you know, we, if you don't want us, that's fine. And there, there, this is something which you see throughout, um, but you also see small pockets on this planet to this very day of people who feel um, that they need to maintain this link um, with these non-human intelligences. And I, I think, um, you know, that is really the, the power and, and the beauty of it, which is that we can enrich our lives uh, by walking down that path. Um, we can enrich this 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 presence of ours on this planet if we realize that we have been here um, and been set here with a mission uh, and that we can do certain things and enable certain things. I wouldn't say that they are as such a, a big brother, uh, but definitely that they are a brother um, or a sister, if you want, um, who walk this, this path with us. And um, I think, you know, it, it would actually be enriching if, if we go into there because Everywhere I look, wherever I see that this contact with non-human intelligences has more than likely happened, I also see extraordinary things having been built, which are a lasting legacy. Um, whereas when I look at certain things um, which weren't that inspired by divine intelligences, uh, I, I don't see beauty. I don't see good things. Um, you know, Dachau concentration camp is currently standing because it's it's pretty much only 60 years ago since they were used. But in 3,000 years from now, they're not going to be standing um, like the monument of the, the Great Pyramid was. And again, it every time you look at certain things which um, show the hand of mankind doing something being guided and helped by non-human intelligences, you see ourselves excelling, uh, trying to reach literally for the scar stars, um, rather than just trying to do things on a kind of like lackluster pace, which is very much what we're doing as a species right now. Well, uh, Philip, I, I actually, I appreciate what you're saying there with um, walking down this path uh, can help us have a, a, a better journey uh, um, because I, I am reticent to believe anything these days and, and yet wanting to believe something, um, but knowing that no matter what I believe today, tomorrow will, it will be different, and that's a guarantee. And even if I were to believe everything that you say today, uh, tomorrow we might discover that we are actually, we are the gods, or we are the gods in the future, and, and now we are just in our own past, or the god, you know, so... I, I like the fact that you are opening us up to uh, at least uh, being able to see another side of something that we have not been able to see before. Absolutely. I mean, and, and I would actually disagree with, with, that, with that final sentence there. We were once opened to these otherworldly realities. We once took it for granted. Um, you know, a century ago, um, pre, um, priests... Uh, kings, presidents were absolutely convinced 
that you could make contact with the divine. Uh, you know, spiritualism was was everywhere, and this wasn't just some new infatuation. Uh, it was something which had been going around for thousands of years. Uh, it's only in the last century and a bit that we really have begun to forget these things because um, from this world of science, um, we're beginning to hear that you know we are at the pinnacle of these things and we are at the top of evolution and we are this and we are that. Um, and we really have become very egomaniac as, as a species. And this is something which has also led, I feel, um, to within our species, certain people having uh, this inflated ego themselves, which has led to an extraordinary amount of war, Mm -hmm. uh, to an extraordinary amount of division, to an extraordinary amount of people dying, uh, to some extent, day in, day out, because what's happening in Africa um, is is still a direct result of of this um, sense Mm -hmm. of superiority of, of certain people on this planet. And this is something which has been happening in very recent times. Indeed. The, one, the one problem is that because science is so insular, um, it doesn't realize that it is new, it's the new kid on the block and it doesn't realize that it has broken away and it really has detached mankind uh, from, from two things. But when you look at this planet, you will see that there is a very strict divide between people who are scientific um, and people who have grown up with age-old belief systems. Uh, on, and you will find that it is with the scientific institutions that you have the egocentricity and that with the uh, belief systems that we are not alone, that you will have peace-loving, uh, extraordinarily insightful people who actually are quite often more um, aware of certain things. I mean, uh, uh, excellent. I, I mean, I mean, a very brief good. note on that is it's basically Jeremy Narby uh, when he took people who were pharmaceutical experts uh, from Switzerland into the Amazon rainforest and he had them speak to you know the, these Amazonian tribes. He made them realize that they were beginners. They were absolute beginners when it came to the expert knowledge, which was uh, almost endemic into uh, the Amazonian jungle as to what they. Knew you about the plant life there and, mm. and this is something which we're beginning to see more and more uh, and this is also something which I think is going to progress in the next few years and I think this is also to some extent uh, what the 2012 phenomenon is really all about well and in a way you're doing exactly like uh, uh, you just said uh, uh, showing us that, that we, we are in some ways neophytes uh, as a civilization about some of this knowledge. Uh, you know, actually, uh, I, I wish you not only good luck with the book, but of course, uh, the series Ancient Aliens. And I, I have met with Giorgio a couple times, and I would love to have you and Giorgio in a, in a room sometime to have more of these kinds of discussions. But for now, we must go. Philip, thank you so much for being on the show with us. It's been a pleasure having this discourse with you. Thank you for having me. And um, yes, George and I, we are sometimes in a room and you will probably need to listen to my uh, wife to uh, report what happens then. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I hope to experience it uh, in person. In the meantime, if you all want to learn about more about Philip Coppins, you can go to our website or you can go to uh, Warwick's uh, Warwick Associates dot net. We'll be back with our producer segment and Mark Lejour right after this. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Life Changes with Filippo is a premier radio show presented by Life Changes Network, which is a company whose team has dedicated their lives not only to positive change, but to helping others observe and embrace, honor, and even celebrate their own changes, thus enabling a more positive, inspired life and helping to create a more positive and inspired world. From everyday people to corporate giants, celebrities, and children, we are here to help and to serve. With heart and experience, we bring our message and positive intent into your home or corporate office and even through appearances on your favorite shows. If you wish to learn more about Life Changes Life Coaching and a private consultation with one of us, corporate event appearances, or if you would like us to appear on your radio or TV shows, visit lifechangeswithfilippo.com and click on our representation page. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with your host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can visit us online via Twitter and Facebook and at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. 
Well, we are back with our producer segment. I am Filippo. And I am Mark. And we have been talking to uh, Philip Copens, uh, discussing the book uh, Odyssey of the Gods that Eric Von Donegan wrote and Philip edited, and of course, Philip's own book, The Ancient Alien Question. And Mark, uh, gosh, I, I, I'm trying to grab, grab, whatever the word is. <laughs> I'm Grab, grappling gravel. with all of it. <laughs> gravel, gravel, gravel. We're coming on Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty amazing stuff. But, but you know, I think what's amazing to me is the certainty with which people do not look at those types of perspectives. Yeah. The certainty with which we follow our belief systems. And And for me, it's always been the other way. I've always looked out in the sky and looked at, at the... The, you know the, the unlimited amounts of, of stars and, and planets and and then and then as knowledge came forth looking at all the monolithic structures and these these, these uh, as he said beautiful things that have been built that stand the test of time and more importantly that we can't make with today's technology and then some of the perspectives that were discussed today seem to me to make more sense than the story, the bits and pieces or the, the mythology as it's been put forth uh, in so many written works. In, indeed. And, you know, I, I don't want to feel stupid. Like, I, I've been duped. I believed it. I believed all this stuff. And, and now it's not that way. And yet, you know, I, here my mind is opening up to this. And maybe someday I'll realize it's not exactly like this. But at least I think we're heading in the right direction. Well, and I think that's the point. I think the, the thing that I would like to see going forward and, and what I'm trying to do with my son is is to establish an always aware uh, environment for learning mm. to, to never come from a place of knowing this is fact this is the way it is uh, but okay. to say here is an idea and let's pay attention until we hear a different idea or learn new things that might change that perspective. But that type of a scenario, because otherwise, you know, we as kids have been given what we were given and told what we were told as an empty vessel. And that becomes the base for programming, the base of belief system, which we operate on until that base is challenged or until we allow it to be challenged. Mm, good point. And, and, you know, I like what Philip said that um, if you look at some of the things that civilization has supposedly done, or he's, he doesn't say supposedly, but I'm saying just leaving that possibility, um, but the civilization has done with the gods and these beautiful things, the pyramids, the monoliths, etc., um, however, he also mentioned, you know, the, the, the tragedies that happened in Germany. And one would think, how, how could the gods let that, allow that to happen? Or would that have been possible without some evil god uh, being a part of it? You, you know, that's where yeah. my mind goes. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. And I've, I've reconciled that. Anybody that has a heart, I think, has to reconcile that type of happening. But I think the reality is, you know, if you're handed a risk board and you're allowed to wipe out an entire country's, uh, you know, playing pieces, it, it, yeah, it's, it's much deeper. It's much more connected. But if this is a game of life that we're playing and a certain baseline of free will based rules were established, when and where do, does one decide that those rules need no longer apply or be applied because we're here to experience contrast? Mm. Mm. Yeah, and you know, talk, like you said, if somebody has a heart, I, I, I have family and friends and people that I love in, in some of these parts of the world, including here, of course, but in some of these parts of the world that are really starting to suffer uh, because of economic uh, downturns or because of, of games that are being played on, on government levels or corporate levels, like, like you, you mentioned here. And, and I, I think... Um, you know, yes, I, I I feel for these people, and and as I hear them talking about, oh, the president said this, or the the prime minister said that, and I and I and I say to them, it's a puppet president. Uh, what do you, you you know? And and yet this, and yet their belief in this president, which is a false belief, 
Um, I, I'm not sure what I'm trying to say because this is new to me. I, I, I don't know what to tell them. It's like, okay, okay, I can tell them it's a puppet president, but that doesn't solve their problem. <laughs> so it I doesn't solve their problem because it, it does not, it's not enough to challenge their belief system, which is whatever I read in the newspaper, whatever I watch in the news is something I need to take as truth because that's the way the information was handled and relayed and people were programmed before. Now, we are getting a barrage of perspectives on the same topic or the same individual or the same theory. And then it's up to us to say, oh, which one feels right? Well, that was the way I used to watch things. But look, this video that I just got on the Internet was produced by somebody else that's outside of the conventional media says something different. And now i got to look at that versus my belief system and start all over again, reconciling what information may or may not be true. What does it mean to me and is it relevant? And how do I then raise my kid? Hmm. Indeed, indeed. Well, one thing I know is that we have come to the top of the hour, and we have had quite a discourse with Philip Coppins and 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 with you, Mark. And I appreciate both of you, and I appreciate Dorothy for helping produce this or producing this so that we could have this discourse on BBS Radio. So I am Filippo Voltaggio, and along with our producers Dorothy Donahue and Mark Lejure and our engineer Seth Hendricks, we thank you for being part of this world and part of the positive change we all wish to see in this beautiful world of ours. Ciao, everyone. You have been listening to Life Changes with Filippo with the master of change, Filippo Voltaggio. Listen live every Monday night at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on the BBS Radio Network and visit us online at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. Today's show has been made possible in part by our sponsors, Ionways Water Systems, Change Your Water, Change Your Life, and Love and Miracles with Dorothy Lee Donahue. To learn more about them, visit the sponsor page of our website. Once again, join us here next week as we consciously explore and embrace the only constant, life changes. Change the world, now's the time. Now's the time.